as a teacher, uh, I have to advise my students on what they should do on and with Twitter and how they should understand it. That's a big stake for me as a, as a university professor. I'm also a student of the changing ecosystem and changing practices of news. I have a lot of questions for our guests, Adam and Nikita, and I distilled my questions into five tweets, which I'm going to try to tweet live. I've tweeted presentations live. I've never tweeted an interview live, so I thought like that would be a cool thing to do. So if you follow my account there, Jay Rosen, NYU, you'll see like I'm going to tweet the questions right at you. Twitter news, Twitter for news, and you run uh, at gov. Journalists learn that it's news versus government, not news and government. So how do these things combine in your mind? And is Twitter saying through your job, out of news and government, that the problems of news and the problems of government are kind of like the same problems? I feel like the Donald Trump of social media panels. <laughs> um, the two have wound up being very complementary. Uh, in part, uh, at a personal level, a function of my own career. Half my career before Twitter was as a journalist, half my career before Twitter was working in politics. Um, so in many ways, it was creating the perfect job for me. Uh, but I'm not the only one who wears both hats. It tends to be the model uh, around the world. And I think there's, there's two big areas of similarity. One is a bit more conceptual. Uh, that goes towards sort of the front part of your question, and one's more practical that goes towards the tail of your question. I think at the philosophic part, it really is the community space of, of Twitter. It's what our former CEO, Dick Costello, used to call the global town square. And you, when you evoke that, that image of the town square, you see these institutions of the courthouse, the city hall, the church, the town crier there with, with the newspaper. And people have come to Twitter to use it as a platform for civic engagement and discussion. And so I think there's a lot of commonality in mission across both news and politics for what we do as a team, which is bringing people into that square to engage, whether that is journalists who use Twitter to gain distribution for quality reporting, journalists who use Twitter to discover new sources and issues, and to take their readers on for the ride, to make news not just something that you read once in the morning and then leave it till the next day, but something that as a reader you can participate in and talk about and be motivated by. So how's that sound? On the politics the side, yeah, what, on the that politics sound? side, one of our big areas of focus is to bring elected leaders out to that same square, to step out from behind the lectern, from behind the spokespeople, and directly engage with constituents and allow people that opportunity to ask questions directly of their elected representatives and have that conversation. And so I think the goal across both verticals is largely to bring that civic conversation out into that public forum where people can participate and connect and be part of the process in a meaningful way. Okay, so are, are on a you, practical level, yeah, which was the back half of of uh, the answer and tied to your question about similar uh, challenges. News organizations, by and large, are not flush with cash right now. Neither is the typical government office. While a lot of big brands movie franchises, TV shows, and so on, have significant budgets behind social media and paid advertising, so on and so forth. News and politics have really needed to rely on that organic side of Twitter, that ability of the quality of the content and the quality of the engagement and the experience <coughs> driving growth. And so as a result, the best practices for news and politics wind up being very similar. Mm. And I think that by bringing more journalists on the platform to, to engage in that regard and having their sources be out in a public sphere, not behind the, the same protective walls, of which I used to be one, uh, I think also creates some very interesting dynamics between press and politics as well. 
Okay, so are you advising the campaigns on how to go around the journalists and then rushing over to advise the journalists on how to stick it to the campaigns? <laughs> News and government. We are advising both groups how to communicate effectively directly with their constituencies and their audience. Okay. Uh, Nikita, I'd love to hear you tell us why should newsrooms work with Twitter? And particularly, why is it in their self-interest to do so? I assume the reasons why people enter into partnerships are because it's in their self-interest. So, I mean, news is such an integral part of the platform. Every day people make news, break news. Uh, people go to Twitter to react to things. So it just makes sense for newsrooms to work with us to be strategic because newsrooms obviously have distributed strategies in terms of using Twitter and other social networks as platforms to not only disseminate content, but again, engage with the audiences. Um, and so, you know, Twitter for many years has been part of the sort of like newsroom audience development sort of suite of tools. So, um, so I think there's just great value in having sort of a newsroom having the finger on the pulse of how people are not only reacting to their content, but engaging with it, engaging with their journalists. Um, and like Adam said, one of my favorite things is when you can go along for the ride with a journalist too, especially if it is a campaign reporter who is, you know, going going for the journey with the candidates too. So I, in my opinion, I feel like it's a very sort of natural relationship. Um, and we, you know, we're very much open to working with all kinds of publishers on all kinds of things too. Uh, the editorial calendar, as you know, uh, can mean anything from Fashion Week, which is uh, right on our heels, to State of the Union, to Super Bowl, Oscars, there's all kinds of things, and newsrooms have, tend to have varying levels of plans for coverage. Um, and so, um, so for me, I love working with newsrooms because I feel like I have a window into newsrooms, having been in many newsrooms myself. Where do, you, where do you see the interest diverging? So I wouldn't really say there, there is much of that, really, in my opinion. Um, I mean, again, newsrooms do have, um, you know, multi sort of prong strategies in terms of social, which they should. But, um, but I, I don't see the interest kind of diverging because Twitter is the place where people do, again, like goes back to that town square. They sort of the best content is posted by everybody on the platform. It could be an eyewitness who has just seen something, and that's part of breaking news, a celebrity, an influencer, politician. So I feel like everyone's interests kind of collide. Uh, yeah, and I think that you know it's, it's less a divergence and more sort of a Venn diagram where we have areas where we don't necessarily overlap, but they're not contradictory. At the end of the day, when news partners come in for a conversation with us, what they're looking for is new sources, new audience, and better engagement with both. And if news organizations or anyone are successful on all three of those points using our platform, that's very good for our business. And that's where we're overlapped. But uh, I know we have some of our colleagues from, from Facebook in, in here, and I very often uh, sit on panels with uh, some from their political team. And one comment we often make is, when we meet with elected officials, this isn't the dating game where you have to pick one of us to go home with. You should be using every platform that reaches your constituency. And so uh, at the end of the day, there will be parts of that social strategy for our partners that do not involve Twitter. Hmm. And so you could say that's where we peel off a little bit. I see. But that's not necessarily a contradiction of interests the way I think the question was okay. formulated. I'm glad you mentioned Facebook because I, I want to ask about that. Um, your counterparts at Facebook visit the same people at news companies. Um, and they grapple with many of the same problems. I've talked to them, so, so I know. Um, given ch recent changes, though, like the fact that uh, Facebook has gotten a lot better at news. They focused on it after having some problems, and like news is showing up much more often now. Um, Facebook and Twitter are going in similar directions with sort of multimedia, the way they're attaching a lot of, especially a lot of video. Um, Facebook has Instagram, which is live, public, and distributed the way 
as uh, Twitter always described itself as. So uh, they're becoming more similar. And the, the difference used to be for, for you guys when you visited news companies, one big difference used to be, well, Facebook is algorithmic, and we're not. But, uh, but that might be changing a little bit uh, too. So, so what are the points of differentiation that you are going to be counting on in the months and years ahead? What are the points of differentiation between you and Facebook in particular that you think will continue to remain true? Well, I think it's a slight bit of a false premise in that we are not in a zero-sum space there. I use Facebook every day, and I work for, for Twitter. Um, we do not need to lose a user for Facebook to gain one, nor vice versa. And so I think just the same way as both platforms are the, part of the strategy for many news publishers, I expect they are both part of the consumption uh, and news diet of the typical news consumer. Uh, what I can speak to is our place in news and how it's been historically and how we, we view things moving forward. You know, Twitter at its core has always been real time public and conversational. And these are the three traits that I think have historically distinguished Twitter among other platforms, not just against Facebook or, or anyone else, but even in more legacy media in, environments. The public nature of the conversation, the real-time live nature of the conversation, and the fact that it is a conversation, that it is a community of interests. And when people gather around an event or around a news story, they can engage in a conversation around that. Now, I, I sometimes in presentations, and I don't have pre-slides or anything here tonight, but talk about this concept of a color wheel. And we all remember the color wheel from grade school, and you've got the big primary colors, then the secondary colors. And when it comes to the sort of news cycle, the primary colors as, as we see them are discovery, consumption, and expression. And that, I think, holds true whether you're talking about Twitter. I find a story in my timeline. I click through to the story on some news organization's mobile website. And then I tweet about it to become part of a conversation. That tweet leads other people to discover it. And the cycle goes round and round. But that's not new to us or anyone else. 100 years ago or last week, someone walking up to a newsstand, browsing the front pages, discovering one they wanted to buy, picking it up, reading it, and then arguing about it at the coffee shop. This is a cycle of daily media consumption that is unchanged across cultures and across time. And so our challenge is how do we continue to take those three differentiating factors, that real time, public, conversational nature of Twitter, and apply it to build the best experience possible at all three of those nodes and the secondary colors in between. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you see us focus with experimenting with new approaches to discovery, new approaches to uh, how we represent conversations, new tools for sharing and, and tweeting, adding images, adding video. Uh, and that's, I think, how we look at it moving forward. What are the problems Twitter discovered it had to which Project Lightning in its various parts is an answer that's coming? So you, I know you guys want to talk about Project Lightning. I think you should. It's something new that Twitter is, is going to be developing. I think it's important in the evolution of Twitter, from what I can tell. Um, but I'd like to know, what are the problems Twitter noticed and decided it had to address? A good problem to have, too much great content. <laughs> too much great content, that's it? Uh, I, I think that we are now at a point with you know, half a billion tweets or more a day that for some users who self-curate a home timeline, follow many accounts, I follow 800 or so, especially when there's a major event, whether it's a news event you know, something like the VMAs, where there is sometimes too much for the typical user to really catch all the great stuff flowing through their home timeline. You're also relying on people then to have pre-curated for that event, to go into that award show, that game, that debate, having selected just the right people to follow, to trust, to be saying all the great jokes, 
bringing you all the best pictures and retweeting all the best tweets. And so the idea of Project Lightning, which we'll be launching later this, this fall, is how do we give a different lens on Twitter? Not take anything away from that home timeline experience, which is part of that public, real-time, conversational bedrock of the platform. Not filtering anything out from there, but giving an alternate perspective on events. Allowing people to, the night of the VMAs, tune in and see the most engaging, most interesting content that has been curated around that event. And for those who want the best of both worlds, how do we meld that back into that timeline experience so that, that users have the choice of how they want to experience that event? Do they want to go old school, watch the fire hose of real-time public conversation flowing in, or do they want more of that lean back experience of seeing the best of? And I think the combination of the two leads to a better experience for all our users. Nikita, how would you answer that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think you know one of our biggest issues is discovery. You know, it's so hard to find that awesome content that's there unless you're following somebody, or you happen to see a retweet from someone, or you know, it's it, it with the real time nature of the platform, it's just very easy to miss things. And so sometimes you might even discover great tweets if they're embedded in a story, right, versus actually on the platform. And so given that 80% of our audience is on mobile, um, you know, I, for one, am thrilled about Project Lightning. I think it's going to be awesome. I think it's going to be a really great way to showcase all the best content. And again, like, um, and, and that will be content objectively from the entire Twitter community. So it's eyewitnesses, folks in newsrooms, you know, key public figures as well. Um, and the cool thing is that uh, this will be the first time Twitter is experimenting with human curation. So Andrew Fitzgerald, who was on the partnerships team, has shifted over to kind of lead editorial efforts, uh, and he's building out a team of curators. So, um, so that, again, is something very different for us something very fun, and the nature of Project Lightning will be covering everything, breaking news, sports, TV, meme of the day, you know, so I really do think that users, existing users and new users to the platform will find it um, to be a great resource. I'm kind of, I call Project Lightning a sort of destination for discovery. Okay. I'm glad you brought up um, the curation team. That's, that's, my, that's my next question. Um, the, the tweet reads that is this Twitter hiring journalists to curate best of tabs is the birth of a new editorial beast so how do we know this beast has a soul <laughs> to me right now I wish we had more than 140 characters <laughs> well we do we can we add 15 minutes actually yeah um, DM the question so here's my question so to me Twitter's always baked into its, itself lots of judgments, lots of decisions have to be made about what's going to be priority. So it's always been saturated with judgment. But it hasn't been, up to now, an editorial company in the way I understand an editorial company, which is trying to create new content that informs people. It's instead trying to be a platform or a system for doing that. But when you get to the point where you're hiring journalists to curate best of feeds around key public events, those people are doing something that is through and through editorial work. So my question is, where does the editorial culture and spirit and animation come from in a company that hasn't been an editorial company up to now? Now, the easy answer to that question, which I know you're going to give me, is, well, we're going to hire professional journalists to do this. We're going to hire people who know how to do this. They are experienced pros, and I get that. Uh, and I know Andrew, and I know how good he is. But you still have to instruct those people. Those people are going to be smart enough to understand where Twitter's bread and butter lies. There's still huge conflicts between good curation, perhaps, and the business interests of Twitter. So my question is, how do you instruct people in an editorial culture that hasn't existed before, and what is going to be the soul of the editorial Twitter? You can see I'm animated by this subject. So I'm banging things and running into stuff. But anyway, that's my question. That's what I meant by soul. Well, I think hiring journalists is certainly 
a part of it, but it wasn't going to be my lead. Mm. I think the lead is that we are already a company of passionate news consumers. You see on the internal email threads uh, around the company about different product features, about uh, different experiences like Project Lightning, around different events. Uh, the emails we get from Jack Dorsey, our founder and interim CEO, uh, about major news stories and so on. Every colleague 201 loves news. It's one of the things that makes them passionate about Twitter because it is such a direct access to great news content and discovery mechanism of great news content. And so I think everyone just as a user of Twitter is already invested in that experience being a quality one. Okay, so I'd people add, at Twitter love news. That's I'd add, part of the answer. Then part of the answer, adding a layer, is of course hiring journalists uh, to do it. We're going to hire professionals. That's a another part. A third of the part of the answer is, you know, one way, in any context, to evaluate the quality of someone's journalism. If you're an editor and charges have had, have been levied against one of your reporters on the quality of their journalism, you'd take their notes. You'd look at the raw tape of the interview. You'd go back to some of the prim primary sources and see all the material they worked with so that you could evaluate whether they did the most appropriate curation of those facts into a reported narrative. To go back to how we described Project Lightning at the beginning, the home timeline isn't going anywhere. The search tools that let you find every single tweet isn't going anywhere. There's no original reporting being created by this team. It is just gathering those tweets. So every single step this team is taking is something that is fully open for other people to see what was curated, what was not curated, and evaluate the quality of the product as, as a result. Mm -hmm. And then the last layer I, I would add is we've provided curation tools to many of our partners. Over, I think, nearly two years ago now, we launched Twitter collections or custom timelines, the ability to manually curate tweets into collected groups around a particular topic or or event, and that was built into TweetDeck. We recently launched a product called Curator that enables newsrooms to do it using a different tool. And so we are going to continue investing in the ability for our partners and for regular users to curate content as well and blend that into to the experience so that our editorial voice, uh, such as it is, isn't the only voice on the platform. Okay. Um. I didn't really get an answer to my question, so I'm going to ask it again. Here's what I mean. When these people go to work, um, there's going to be like a launch day where they're covering some event, right? And Andrew and his team of curators are um, scanning, presumably using algorithmic tools to help them. I, we didn't mention that, but I assume that's part of it, right? Using tools to help them. And they're going to be picking uh, what deserves to be in a best of tweet, right, a uh, stream. So the act of choosing is inherently a editorial act. And what I'm asking is, how are you going to instruct them to do that? Like, what are we looking for when we're picking? How do we think about the potential conflicts between, for example, big customers for Twitter and uh, Happening, happening to pick their tweets as best does, right? How do you govern like simple conflicts like that? An editorial company has a structure already built in place for that. Twitter does not necessarily. So how, what are they supposed to be? What's like the program or editing selection criteria, the decision rule that they're supposed to be employing when they do this curation? Sure, so yeah, so I don't want to speak for Andrew, but I can say that uh, he and the team are coming up with a set of editorial guidelines, mm. and they do try, they do want to be objective. So they're going to, you know, not keep advertisers in mind and really focus on the social narrative. That really is the sort of core of Project Lightning, is whatever the topic is, whether it's a, an NFL game or a breaking news story, it is all about picking the best content and the best tweets to kind of highlight that story. Whether it's a new story, whether it's uh, in progress, or even like a next day follow-up to, to a story type thing. So 
So they're definitely thinking in terms of like a mini newsroom. They have editorial meetings every day. Mm -hmm. They make decisions. They talk together. They consult about, you know, how to categorize things. Um, so it is very much like a sort of think about, you could think of it this way as, as a mini incubated newsroom within the company. And it's an experiment, you know, and, and we really do hope Project Lightning has a big impact on the product. Um, and so, um, so soon enough, you'll get to hear and see more about it. And I think I, I would add there that you know, Andrew's team is crafting a set of editorial guidelines, not finalized yet, but one that has been made absolutely clear, and this was part of the reason why Andrew left the partnerships team, is that we're not going to have a say in what's chosen. Uh, it's been made very clear to our team that if one of our partners is knocking on our door saying, hi, why aren't you curating our, our tweets more? Mm -hmm. There's not going to be an ear listening for that on, on that team. And I think, at least from, from my experience at the company, I've been at Twitter uh, for five years, and not once in those five years has any partnerships decision I've been involved with on the news side been driven by anything from the advertising side. Mm -hmm. On the politics side, uh, when I used to have meetings with elected officials, I'd always go in and make perfectly clear, I am not our lobbyist. Mm -hmm. I am not our salesperson. And so from day one, I was in this position. There was always a respect of, of that firewall. And so while the exact contours of this challenge may be new, the broader aspect of where do firewalls need to be in place, mm. where do separations need to be in place, is something that I think we've had a pattern of experience with executing successfully. You remember the suggested users list? That was one of the, the closest things I can think of to the curation that you're gonna, about to enter into now. It was around 2009, 10, I think it was, um, Twitter wanted people to onboard more easily, and so one of the things it did is it had suggested users, people to follow off like the home page or the sign up page. And uh, the suggested users um, experienced a soaring following accounts when, when they were recommended, as you might expect, because lots of people are looking for directions. So, so picking those people who should be the suggested users, right, isn't an objective process, very difficult thing to automate, right? It's not something that the numbers are going to tell you how to do that for. Uh, except for the fact that now that's exactly how it works. Now it does. <laughs> but I'm saying when Twitter yeah. picked suggested users, which was a kind of an editorial function or similar to it, I, it didn't give me a lot of confidence it, that, that, that the people involved thought through the principles they were using to pick them and not them, that they understood the power they had when they did that, that they considered lots of different alternatives. And it, like, it just didn't seem like Twitter thought that through very carefully. So I recommend that as a reference point, because what you're engaged in now is very similar to that. It's like, if, if, if I ask you, OK, I'm your new curator. What do you want me to do? Like, how should I approach this? And your answer to me is, oh, well, just pick the best stuff. Okay, it just doesn't tell me a lot, right? It doesn't, it doesn't explain to me what I'm supposed to be doing. But you answered it twice, so that's as, that's as, that's as many times as we're going to ask it. Um, and to put a, a kicker on the story, I'd also say we are blessed with a very vocal user base that's very good at telling us when a new feature yes. is working or not working. Yes, and I am part of that very vocal <laughs> yeah. user base. And if this is to put it very crudely and through shorthand, but if the ice bucket feed comes and takes over, that's going to be it for me and Twitter. Like I, I will, dis I, I will consider that a change in the contract between me as a user who puts some time into Twitter and is and puts content into Twitter. Like I enter content into Twitter every day, uh, and I literally spend hours on it. So I have to decide at any one time what's the contract, what's the give get bargain. And an algorithmic feed, if that became the way people experience Twitter, I think that bargain would be gone for me as a user. It's not a question. It's just moderator's prerogative to complain. <laughs> um, OK, we're going to now turn it over to you. I am uh, Harry Wasebrin. I co-founded an online video network called Act.TV. And huge fan of Twitter. I'm entirely reliant on it day to day, picking up my news. But 
also generally for my business, trying to find uh, what the best videos are to curate day to day, what to do with it. And particularly, I'm on TweetDeck and have dozens of columns, follow thousands of people. And in these kind of sessions, though, I very, hear very little about that. Uh, Adam, you mentioned you follow 800 people. I can't imagine myself only following 800 and how difficult that must be to curate that so closely. And I also have about 60 lists. So <laughs> Exactly, though. So every time I hear about where Twitter is going and what they're trying to do for their next steps, I hear very little about TweetDeck and, and the power users and especially with the news who are so, so reliant on so, so many different people to follow and curate, et cetera, when does that come in? When is there going to be like the big next version of TweetDeck, even one that costs money? Like, take my money. I'll spend a lot of money on a much better version of TweetDeck because it's very similar to what it was when it first started, frankly. Yeah, I mean, I think at, at the end of the day, uh, one of the challenges we've, we've seen is that the user group that is probably most represented in this room is not necessarily representative of the overall user base of the platform. Uh, more than 80% of Twitter usage right now is on mobile devices, uh, which isn't necessarily the practical format for something like, like TweetDeck, if, if you will. Um, even things like lists and so on and so forth have been hard to sort of get in there in a lightweight way that doesn't overload that consumer experience. Uh, TweetDeck remains a priority. It's certainly one managing news and politics for Twitter, probably the most vocal two user groups uh, for the product. Was just over in London with the, with the product team for that. Uh, and they're continuing to, to iterate and, and make improvements. Uh, but you're right, they don't have quite the same fanfare as what's in the consumer product just because it is targeted towards a more niche group. So yeah, I'm much like you, I'm a huge TweetDeck user, have been for many years, and so getting to actually meet some of the team and talk to them was really a, a real treat, actually. And, um, and what's fascinating is that team is in London, and they're actually rather small. So, uh, so that was very interesting for me to learn. And, um, you know, they do hope to try to get to some level of, of parity between, you know, our main platform and the features that they offer. Slowly but surely, you do see them rolling out different things and, and sort of catching up. But um, but yeah, I was just fascinated that you know I love that platform. I think it's awesome, and um, and they do hope to keep iterating. So you know, any feedback that you have, we are the best people to take it to them and sort of discuss you know with them why it's needed and kind of maybe help try to prioritize things a little bit too. Um, but just knowing that again, they're they're a very uh, small but stealthy team. Real quick, Adam, you'd agree that you can't both rely on power users and then when they tell you their problems, say you're not representative, right? Oh, no, I absolutely agree with that, which is, which is why there's still uh, a heavy investment in TweetDeck and in tools like Curator, which I would put in that same category as a pro-level tool. Um, if you look at things like the ability to build Twitter collections and so on and so forth. That was built entirely into TweetDeck. It's not even available in the consumer product. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it speaks to how we we perhaps differentiate the 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 size of the teams dedicated to sure. <laughs> to to working on it, as Nikita mentioned. Also where the investment may be more on publishing tools than on consumption tools for the professional user right now mm -hmm. uh, with things like Curator and, and so on. Um, and lastly, when there are improvements to, to TweetDeck, and they've rolled out some really nice uh, additions just in the last few weeks, they don't get the same fanfare because it doesn't have that same user base. Uh, the reaction to Project Lightning seemed to be a lot of, um, I mean, it was, it was pretty str a very strong reaction to people's timelines being curated by an algorithm, uh, I think it indicates that you know, the world wants a neutral agnostic stream, that, that you can choose what you're going to follow, you see everything that comes in. And so the ship has sailed for that on Facebook, but I do feel like the world wants that neutral stream. So is, is Twitter committed to being that, and do you think that'll be the default landing page for Twitter going forward? After the launch of Project Lightning, your home timeline is still going to be there, and it's going to look exactly the day it did the way it did the day before. This is, Project Lightning is about creating a alternate lens and leaving you with the choice of how you want to consume the content on the platform. So no default. 
I think the home screen is, stay, is going to stay the home screen. We know, we know how passionate people are about their own curated timelines. You know, you specifically follow people, unfollow people. You know, like I follow, I try to follow any journalist that follows me. I think I follow several thousand people. So like, much like Adam, I have many, many lists and I'm constantly tweaking my columns and tweet deck and calibrating depending on what's happening. But, um, but yeah, so far we have no plans to tinker with the main home timeline because again, we know that that's such a core part of the platform. And it's the reason why many of us love the platform and are so passionate about it today. I am one of those passionate people yes, you are. <laughs> and that also vents all the time on Twitter. Uh, I'm Anthony Quintano. I'm the social media manager for the Today Show. Um, my question is, do you feel that the average person is represented well on Twitter, considering that such a drastic amount of average users on Facebook versus Twitter? So when I have producers and people asking me to do stuff on Twitter versus, you know, Facebook, um, you know, with the, I, I have a hard time answering that question because I feel like, you know, when, when you see that number of how many people are talking about something on Twitter or, you know, when I see the tweets about this many people tweeted about this, are those actual people half the time? Are those just news accounts that are tweeting the article 10,000 times over? You know what I mean? Like, I, I've, I see, the, the drastic amount of engagement difference on a Facebook platform versus Twitter, uh, how do you feel about the average person being represented on Twitter? Do you feel that is the case? I, I think it is. I mean, I think there, it's hard, and this certainly comes up a lot on the politics side, especially when folks try to use Twitter as a substitute for political polling and, and so on. One challenge is we don't ask most